What's up guys, welcome back to the next episode of the Mighty LS Swaps GQ. Uh, where we left off last episode, we were very uninspired and pretty somber about the whole thing with how much it's uh, it's really not playing the game where it's with us. So I'm um, using a different camera today because I happened to leave my other camera at home. So I'm just going to roll with this one. Might be time for a change up anyway. Let me know how you find the quality of this video compared to, to previous episodes. I appreciate everyone's input. So anyway, we're here this morning, continuing on with our fault finding process. I uh, pulled the loom up a bit today and we've swapped injector plugs eight and six over. We're just gonna run it like that. See if the issue moves from number six to number eight. If it moves to number eight, then we know it's injector related or injector wiring related at least. But if it stays on number six, we know that it must be something to do with the coil or the coil wiring. Um, so that's where we're starting with. So let's go. So a nice little exercise uh, proved that it is an issue with the injector wiring or the wiring to number six injector plug. So, um, you know, unplugging then number six from number eight uh, deleted the problem while cylinder six was still running off number eight injector plug <coughs> and uh, it wasn't, wasn't causing an issue. So we've proven that it's that injector wiring to that plug. So from here, um, we are going to keep them plugged in in this orientation, keep them swapped over. But what we're going to do is at the ECU plug, at the ECU end, we're going to re-pin the six and eight triggers. Um, so we're going to swap them over. So that way, even though we swap the injector plugs, they'll be running in the correct firing order for the injectors, right? And the pins come out the back. How good. All right, so experiment did not prove what we wanted it to prove or expected it to prove. So we are seriously getting to a point where we're about to start tearing our hair out. So we repinned six and eight at the plug and um, you know, we expected the problem to stick with the wiring that would have been injector six because we thought it would be a wiring issue, but it didn't. The issue then moved to what was pinned at six. So even though number six injector trigger was running through all of number eight injectors wiring, the, the problem moved to that set of wiring, which means it's not an issue with the wiring. Um, and considering we've tried two different ECUs and it didn't make a difference, we are not inclined, you know, it's, we're, <laughs> this is just the most frustrating stuff. This thing is really getting to the point where we are running out of ideas. Uh, we've proved that it's nothing hardware related. We've proved that it's nothing mechanical because it moves, it's not cylinder specific to the engine. It will move to number eight when we move that plug to number eight. Um, that's where the problem will move to. So it's not mechanical and we've proved that it's nothing hardware. We've tried swapping the coils, swapping leads, plugs. Um, we've even tried swapping the ECU and it still did the same thing. And today now we've proved that it's not wiring related because we switched the, the trigger at the ECU and the problem then moved to a whole other set of wiring for that injector. So it's not injector related because it moves with cylinders as well. We've tried a whole nother rail. You know, we've, we have tried everything hardware and everything electrical that we can um, you know even to the point where we tried that other ECU yesterday and it still did the same thing and it's just got us absolutely cooked at this point the only thing we can really think of is that it's a, a problem with this operating system maybe it's a corrupt OS but there is it's risky with the E38s swapping OS's around so 
not super keen on on trying that but it's it's we're really we're running out of other things to to point the finger at i mean at the very least i'm, I'm sort of relieved that it's not a wiring issue i'm relieved that uh, obviously this wiring seems to be okay um which is all good i'll, I'll re re-wrap up that loom um so that is a relief because it would have been a pain to try and find but at the same time we still have no results or we have no we have not isolated the problem to anything specific um except for what appears to be the number six trigger at that ecu which we know is not hardware because they did it on two different ecus so it's starting to look like maybe it's an operating system problem anyway regardless it's absolutely doing our heads in um you know like i said in the last episode it probably wouldn't be so bad if we weren't already so far behind with this project you know the owner it's his work uh, he needs it back for work he needs it back pretty much this week it's now wednesday we're running out of help we're running out of time i can't work tomorrow i've got to go down do other things uh we've still got to get ac lines sorted so that we can get this thing mod plated and gassed up and we've still got things to finish off um you know just just final touches mounting things and stuff like that we've still got a few final things to do to it and we're starting to run out of time and we still haven't diagnosed this issue 100 percent and it's just holy crap is it frustrating anyway it seems nuts but at this stage the only thing that has remained the same through this whole fault finding process the only thing that we haven't swapped out or changed is the operating software that's it it's the only thing we haven't changed uh you know we tried the other uh, e38 yesterday um that was with the same os that's in this and the same tune uh and so we changed the hardware but the os stayed the same so this os is the only thing that has stayed consistent through this whole fault finding process and we've isolated it down to being that number six trigger so in my mind i'm thinking it has to be os i can't think of anything else that it could be we've ruled out every other possible issue that i can think of all right so while we contemplate our life choices decided to have just a big clean up because we had another clean up in the shed pretty much since we started this conversion so we really needed to do a bit of a clean up so clean up a lot of the tools and stuff that were around and that's all good and uh we're trying to figure out how we can go about trying to test our theory uh you know as weird as an os issue would be like i said it's literally the last thing we've got to replace so we're pretty confident that's what it's got to be because it's the only thing left but uh, for anyone who's worked with E38 PCMs before and stuff, uh, it, once you start trying to flash different OSs into them, um, you know, they're very sensitive. It's really easy to hurt their feelings. So they get, they get sad and they lock you out and they do all sorts of funny stuff. So there's a lot of risk involved in just going ahead and just trying to smash another OS into a PCM that's not coded for that VIN and, and stuff like that uh, without going too far in detail with it. It's risky. So we're trying to sort out a way that we can sort of try it and know that it's gonna work without it costing us heaps of money and licensing and stuff for other for other HP tuners you know it's we're trying to sort that out but in the meantime uh, we have still got some stuff to finish off in the car which you would have seen from last episode so we still got to get everything in the dash working Rex has managed to get the taco working finally uh, we found the problem there which is awesome so cars got a taco now and I'm going to be working on getting the uh, the temperature and the oil pressure in the dash working which are the last things that we need to get everything in the cluster working so we hadn't worried about it for the dyno because obviously we have all of that on our HP tuners on VCM scanner we, we get all that data but for the owner to be driving this out in the desert and whatever he needs to be able to see what's going on with temp and oil pressure so uh this is just something that i totally missed when i was actually building you know do, doing the cam and everything when i was getting the engine ready uh and it's yeah just just missed it totally dafted it uh and when the owner took the motor he actually took these sensors with it uh which we got him to bring back out the other day when he came out for the tune so uh what we have here is the old water temp sensor out of the TB, as well as the old oil pressure sensor, which was also out of the TB. And uh, these, these work with the circuit on the dash. Uh, and Mark's adapters actually so kindly supply these adapters to use with these sensors. So this is an adapter that goes into the LS head, which adapts to the water temp. Uh, and as you know, we have two heads and the water temp for the ECUs in one head. And at the back of the, the driver's side head, there's a blank port where you can put this in and then we just put our water temp sender into that put the wire on should work on the dash um, and they also supply this which is the oil pressure adapter so the oil pressure sensor on these gen 4s is at the back um, uh, in the valley plate behind the, the intake manifold uh, so it's a bit of a pain to get through so i really wish that i did get this um, 
you know, while I was putting the motor again, it would have been a lot easier. But, so you take the, the factory one for the LS out, you stick this one in its place. Uh, the factory sensor for the LS then goes back into the top. And then we have our little 1 8 NPT off the banjo bolt head thing, uh, which goes to the factory sensor and then that should work on the dash. So uh, Rex has already gone through and found the inputs for the dash and uh, labeled them. So pretty simple job. Just got to get these adapters in, put the sensors in and wire them up. So I'll go through that and we should have everything on the dash working. So we're just talking to a few people about confirming what we can do about getting this OS sorted without it A, being a problem um, and causing us issues and, and B, costing a lot in licensing stuff. So anyway, as we, as we do that, we'll finish off whatever we can in the car. I've still got to sort out that uh, accelerator pedal bracket and we've still got a bit of wiring and stuff to tidy up and I can rewrap this loom now that we know it's not a wiring issue as well. So. Got taco, got oil pressure, temps just coming up, fuel fuel level gauge always worked, volts still working, speedo works still, taco's bang on, so everything on the cluster working again. You so as far as the taco goes, we got it working using the box that Mark's 4 Drive actually supply with the kit for the conversion which is this one here, and it actually, uh, for GUs that have a different speedo input, I believe, I think it works for them as well. I'm not sure uh, whether the GU, the speed input's the same where it comes off the transfer, I don't know what the go is, but um, it does work for converting a speed signal for a speedo as well, if you need that for your conversion. So this converter box would be very useful for heaps of different conversions to heap, heaps of different cars. Uh, so we just, uh, there's, there's a spare pin on the E30, on the E38, uh, which we just hijacked here. There was already a spare one that had been cut off. Um, so we just use that, pin to, the, to that pin, and then you can set it to be attack output on HP tuners. <clears throat> and then that input just goes into the, the, the tra uh, conversion box. Um, and then the conversion box sends the signal out to the tack on the dash. And you can do fine adjustments on the conversion box. And you can also adjust the output on HP tuners uh, for the, from the PCM as well. So. That's awesome. The speed on this just comes straight from the transfer. We didn't have to touch that. That didn't, didn't change anything because we're still using the standard transfer. Um, and yeah, that's it. Then those adapters that Mark's 4 Drive supplied to adapt the stock sensors. And we just went through this wiring here and found which sensors were what. Um, this is why a lot of this wiring still hasn't been tidied up because we're still going through it. So in this plug, that one there that I've cut out, that was the coolant, which is just a single wire to that spade. And then there was another plug down here which was the oil temperature, uh, oil pressure, sorry. Uh, so the oil pressure sensor, the little fly lead in this plug all appears to be one piece. Uh, sorry, if I could point the camera the right way. Sorry guys, I'm not used to this camera. Uh, but it all seems to be one piece. So that's why I decided to extend it and put the plug actually over there. That way, if the owner ever has to replace that oil pressure sender, he can just buy a new one and bolt and it'll go straight in. He doesn't have to worry about uh, re-extending wires and stuff like that. So trying our best to make sure that, uh, you know, every modification we do um, is still really easily serviceable and easy to get parts for. Um, so that's what we've done there. Uh, and that all works. Obviously we'll tidy up a lot of this wiring. Um, there is one other thing I do want to do with the wiring as well. And that is I've got another little fuse box. Um, Cause we originally, when we hooked this up, which is the power to the fuse box, um, we were trying to run it through this uh, circuit breaker, but the circuit breaker is a, like a momentary circuit breaker. It kept shutting off. Um, we thought we could repurpose it. It was something to do with the gas system, but ev evidently we can't. Um, we're only trying to do that because we didn't have any fuse holders in stock that I could put in line um, for a single fuse holder for that power into the fuse box. But uh, what I've decided to do is run the fans supply the fan relays in the fuse box with their own separate power. So each fan's gonna have its own power source straight from the battery. Uh, and that's just gonna take a lot of the load off that single power and in source input into the fuse box. Now, if you weren't running the thermos, I don't think it'd be a problem, but um, the way that this has been done is we've got one power in through this plug, which is powering everything that the fuse box is running. So this fuse box is running our fuel pump, um, you know, all of our engine side stuff, our PCM, uh, BCM, um, and both our fans. So, you know, as far as your actual engine side things, core packs, injectors, uh, and then, you know, the ECU and the BCM and the, the shifter and that sort of thing, all that stuff really draws SFA 
amperage. Um, that would all be fine. Even the, the fuel pump, it's only a Walbro 255. I think they're about seven amps continuous, not a big deal. But thermo fans, they draw a crap load of current. Now I'm not 100% sure on what these VE thermo fans actually are like, but you know, things like AU thermos, I know for a fact that they draw like 20 amps continuous and you know, 25, sometimes 30 amps on startup. So, you know, these Nava plugs, they're only rated for 20 amps. So you could imagine twin thermos and then the fuel pump and then everything else. It's, it's massively overloading that single power in the way it is. Um, so to alleviate some of the, the pressure and the amperage, I suppose, for that single power in, I'd like to just run two powers and just hijack the fan relays. Um, so there's gonna be two brand new uh, inputs for the fan relays, or maybe just one big one if I can find one and just uh, daisy chain the two fan relays and set it up with fuses up right close to the battery. I wanted to fuse that power input at the battery anyway because I don't like having long runs of not fused wire like this, um, as I said in a previous episode. Anyway, like I said guys, I'm no auto sparky, so I, I'm only going off what I know about electrical systems from what I knew from studying what I've studied. Um, so it may not always be continuous amperage. Well, I'm not sure, not 100%, but I just feel a lot more comfortable having their own powers for them two fans, considering that they generally, thermo fans draw a crap load of current. Anyway, unfortunately at the moment, we don't have any wire big enough to do what I want to do. So I'm gonna to have to get some tomorrow, but this is the little fuse box I'm gonna use. It's just a little Nava fuse box. Each one's rated at 30 amps, which would be heaps. So, you know, by the time you have a 30 amp for each fan, which should be plenty, and then a 30 amp for whatever's left, which is just pretty much the EFI system and the fuel pump, that's, that's heaps, that's plenty. So I'll be very happy with that. All right, so Rex has got the dash all back together, which is looking great. It's looking real nice. So we're just now working on getting rid of the old ECU and TCM because they're not doing anything anymore. Uh, and that way we have a nice little area to put our uh, LS BCM because it's running the shifter. Um, so I'm gonna hide that and then put all the factory carpet and everything back over it so it looks nice. Um, and then after that, we can start looking at getting our center console back in so you can see that new boot that we've been talking about for the shifter. And um, yeah, start actually really finalizing a lot of the stuff in this car and, and getting it buttoned up properly. So the other thing is we were sort of hoping to try and get it somewhere to get these AC ones sorted this week. Now that we know that this miss is caused by an injector, it's an injector issue, we're not too keen on driving the car anywhere because obviously the injector problem, it's running lean. Lean on one cylinder if it's if it's missing sort of thing. So, you know, if it was just a coil problem, um, we wouldn't probably have been too worried. I would have been happy enough to take it um, up into town sort of thing. Uh, it's not that long of a drive to get the AC line sorted so that they were done so that we could get it gassed up and mod plated, etc. But knowing that it's a fuel problem, we're not too keen to take that risk. So unfortunately, we're just gonna have to wait until after we get this sorted, which hopefully is soon, to get the actual AC line sorted and get it gassed up and everything. But anyway, the other thing is we have to still make sure that the AC compressor is engaging off our trigger setup and we still have to trigger the, the fan relay with that as well. So we'll keep our little taco box up in here as well, as well as probably the, the receiver for our bimodal setup. We'll probably all be kept up, up around here in the in the footwell and stuff out of the way. Dun, 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 dun. So the last thing that we are sorting right now is getting our reverse lights working again. So obviously now we have a different gearbox and the reverse light um, switch, I guess you'd say, um, output is from the new gearbox. So we have to then wire that from our loom to the existing car to, to uh, turn on the, the reverse lights. So. That's what we're doing currently. Um, I believe that's pretty much the last thing that we have to sort out as far as integrating, you know, like the loom from that AC. I think this is the last thing we have to do. Um, yeah, and then we're pretty much on the home stretch as far as just tidying up and, and getting everything together. So as you can see, without that TCM down there, there's heaps of room for that BCM to be placed. Rex is gonna make up a plate just to go over the, the top of it and uh, protect it a little bit like the old TCM was, just because, you know, it's in direct firing line of being kicked and it is only a plastic box. So the last thing we want is for someone to kick that and damage it. So just a, a nice steel flat plate will protect that heaps. Our bimodal and, and taco box and everything can go up in the kick panel, that's fine, out of the way. And it's just gonna be nice and tidy in here. Yep. 
All right, so while I was just blabbing to you about our wiring, um, Rex actually had the thought that this might not be positive 12, it's actually a negative trigger, which he is correct. So we just checked that, it's actually a negative trigger, which just means we have to set this up to trigger a relay to turn the lights on instead of powering the lights straight up. So, bit of a pain, bit more to do, but that's what you do. So just been here trying to fit up this kick panel and, and trim it up around the pedal mount as well to try and get it to fit right. And um, now that I've got the kick panel in, I'm actually looking at how close the pedal is to the kick panel to that fuse box cover. And personally for me, that would absolutely annoy the crap out of me if that was like that. Um, so I, I've got to assume that the owner would probably be the same. To me, that's just too close. You know, that's just annoying. That would be annoying to drive. And as you can see by the two bolt holes up there that line up and bolt up, there's plenty of room. I can just redrill them uh, and move the pedal over a good sort of 10, almost probably 15 mil. Can move it over. That would set it much, much nicer, I believe. So given that the, the top of the mount doesn't actually line up with anything anyway, um, I'm thinking I'll probably redrill them holes to move that pedal over a bit and then I can just trim the top wherever I need to to get it to fit uh, and then we can sort of decide how we're going to try and secure the top of the mount um, if, if we want to do that. We just left those two bolts done up the whole dyno session and it's actually the thing's strong as. Um, there's not really any particular reason that we need to, to really mount the top of the bracket so uh, at this stage I might just trim it up and we'll just have a look at it but I'm definitely going to try and move that pedal over because that would annoy me to no ends. All right, so now with this out, I can show you what I was talking about the other day. So we've got that loom that runs through the firewall right there, which is uh, was massively clashing with our pedal mount bracket. So that's the sort of clearancing that I did on the backside. So moving this over is actually gonna help with that problem as well. Uh, so sort of two birds of one stone by moving it over. I think it's definitely gonna be better. Fig jam, boys and girls. I must say the actual, the whole bracket fits up there much nicer in that position. Um, seems to clash with a lot less stuff. Way more room for this loom to go past the floor. Uh, I think it's just all round. Nice, seems like a nice way to do it to me. Anyway, while I'm doing that, Rex is starting to now, now that we've got all our sensors and stuff hooked up, Rex is starting to now go through all of this wiring, which we are no longer requiring to start getting rid of it. As you can see, yeeting that out. Anyway, none of the top of this mount clashes with anything, but um, so I'm just gonna leave it on there for now. But um, just just how strong this whole mount is where it sits, I, I don't believe it's necessary to, to go trying to mount the top of it at all. That's been fine on the dyno, everything is it's strong as, so. All right, that is just so much better. I'm so glad I did that. Just that little bit, like that extra 15 mil just makes all the difference. That's so much nicer. Beautiful. All right. So I'll start tying all this wiring up and um, start putting our covers and seal panel back on. That'll be the driver's side just about sorted. So as you can see, lots of lots of clutter gone from this corner. Rex has removed heaps of it. Heaps of that stuff just gone out of the way. Um, so this is all the wiring we're left with. This is all we actually need out of all that. So a lot of crap gone. Um, so these are our reverse lights left here, um, which we can't hook up until we get a relay. So. This is going to be power in and plus ignition switch to the relay. This is going to be a power back to the reverse lights. And this here comes from the loom inside, which is actually triggered from the gearbox as a negative trigger for the reverse lights. So triggered. triggered. So uh, tomorrow I'll get another few. We're, we're out of fuse holders. Uh, sorry, not fuse holders. We're out of relay holders and stuff like that. So that's why we are just doing getting it already. Tomorrow when I go on my little gallivant around, I'll get another fuse. Um, fuse, god damn, it's been a long day, sorry guys, relay holder. Uh, we're also going to get some Coro just to run um, these wires for the sensors in, some corrugated, you know, sheathing, just, just to tidy it up more than anything, um, and all this up here, so. And then we'll put our little four fuse holder there, the new powers from the fan, for the fans, um, and then there'll be another relay there for the reverse lights. Our new fan powers will go across there as well, which will probably run in that same conduit, I suppose. I'm looking at the PCM. I'm going to mount it on a bit of an angle on up like that so that we can sort of cover a lot of the, the wiring joints and stuff that's under there, or all our plugs like that under there. Just covers them a bit. I was thinking about mounting it down flat, but I think it's going to be tidier to actually build, make some strap and mount it on a bit of an angle there. Um, but yeah, apart from that, we're pretty much all sorted. I've finished tidying up the driver's side here. So all of the, the trim and kick panel and everything's back on here and it's looking nice and tidy. I'm so glad I moved that pedal over. It's just so much better. 
Um, so yeah, that's what the driver's side looks like. It's getting pretty late, so I'm probably gonna call it a day today. I've got, obviously I've got the stuff to do tomorrow, so I won't be here tomorrow, but Rex will probably play around a bit more tomorrow. All right, guys, we are back. It's now Friday. Yesterday, Rex actually tried a new operating software in this thing, and we were still having the exact same issues. So, still having the same problems. It's not the operating software, um, and you know, we, <laughs> I wasn't here yesterday, but um, you know, between, between everything that we've done, for this thing to try and fault find, we were really getting to the end of our depth of where to go to next. So I started reaching out to a few other people that may have an idea. Um, I've been talking a little bit to Jay Fagan at Auto, Con uh, Auto Electrics Conversions by Jay Fagan um, down there in Victoria, and he's been a massive help. So big shout out to him. Uh, he actually pointed me in the direction, apparently the E38 PCM, apparently if it detects an issue with a coil on a cylinder, it will shut down the injector for that cylinder. And given this information, it sort of makes a lot of sense that uh, you know the problem consistently is always staying on the trigger for number six. And even when we repinned the wiring for the injector, it moved to eight. But that's because um, you know the, the wiring for eight was being triggered as six. So if it was still detecting that was an issue with a coil on number six, it would still be shutting down whatever injector it thought was triggering as number six. So it sort of makes a bit of sense. However. D38, if it was having a misfire problem, it should be giving us a DTC. It should be coming up on the scanner that there is a misfire issue. So it's hard to imagine that we have a misfire issue without it saying anything. But I mean, honestly, at this stage, we're not willing to rule out anything. We're willing to try whatever, anything that anybody could suggest to us um, that you know we know may have had a similar issue before. We are, we are more than happy to try pretty much anything at this point because as weird as it would be, that it wouldn't be giving us a DTC or a problem with a misfire. It's also super weird that it's just got this misfire, misfire that's apparently caused by nothing and not going away. So, you know, anything's possible at this stage. So we've got another tune to do today, so we're gonna get onto that, but then we're gonna get back to this. We're gonna try a few things. We're gonna try just disconnect the knock sensors altogether and see if that does anything. We don't believe it's the knock sensors. It's the same thing where we're not getting anything in the in the scanner or in, in the ECU that's telling us that anything to do with knock, but once again, just, willing to just try to rule out whatever we can. So we're gonna do that this afternoon. Um, if it's not knock sensors, which we don't believe it is, uh, we'll then move on to doing some similar tests that we did with the injector wiring and the injector triggers, but do it with the coils. So if you do the same thing where we repin the coil triggers at the ECU end and swap six and eight, and then we can just swap the plug leads on the plugs, uh, then we know that if the issue then moves to eight, um, then we can be pretty pretty confident that it's a, it's a problem with the coil side of the wiring and that issue could then in turn be affecting the injector side. So that makes a bit of sense. So hopefully that's the problem. We'll get to it back on the, this afternoon. But anyway, again, yeah, just uh, like that other turbo patrol we had in the other day and a few other things, you know, this is a, a pretty good insight to the not so glamorous side of what we do and how badly this can affect business. Um, we're falling really far behind. We've got a lot of cars piled up around us. So. But anyway, yesterday Rex sort of finished off the passenger side, um, which is real nice. So the BCM's nice and up under there and protected and out of the way and it all looks factory and looks awesome. So the last thing is just the OBD plug, which uh, we're actually just talking about. We're probably going to deep in it and then actually put it up in the glove box just so it's nice and easy to get at and also out of the way and nice and tidy. I'll show you what I'm going to do with that. This end, that's only just sitting there. Oh, it's just sitting there. That's your bimodal in the pack interface and then that was where the BCM is it's actually just sit behind that and that's a solid nice. aluminium plate to protect it so. and some you can see the um, heat our uh, heat mat that I put on the firewall there just to protect the BCM as well yeah very cool so that's inside getting pretty close to being sorted uh, yesterday while I was running around I got that wiring that I wanted to use to get just to run the fans on their own as well So I got some 50 amp twin core. I had to get 50 because it was all I could get uh, Rex finished off the relay for the reverse lights, which is up mounted up there. So that's our reverse light relay now So, you know as far as little final touches and finishing off the car, we're getting all good um, <clears throat> The only other thing that we've got as well as we're still don't have O2s in the car. Um, it's still only running in open loop because we're still waiting on our extensions to get here because Australia Post lost them, which is awesome. So the only other thing is if that is for some reason, whatever, again, weird things that happen is affecting the adaptives on one cylinder. I can't imagine why it would affect it on one cylinder and it should run fine in open loop. But again, like I said, I 100% say that no. It's not Rex reckons 100% no, but I'm still at a point where I just, I'm that flabbergasted and beaten by this thing that 
Um, I wouldn't be surprised if anything is the problem, honestly. So. <laughs> The thing desperately still needs a lot of good, you know, the tune needs still a lot of work, which is frustrating because we don't want to go spend heaps of time on the tune when we don't have this issue sorted because it's probably just a waste of time. But it's annoying because we still got to, you know, test, make sure the, the box is doing everything it should be doing on road sort of thing. We need to go for a road test with the box. We're still not 100% sure of that. So the more this issue continues, just the further behind we get with this car and then it's further behind with everything. And it's just, it's very stressful. It's, it's really stressful. So compression test came back awesome. Not even gonna bother with the leak down. Pretty much as we expected it to happen. Uh, but you know, at least now we know for sure we've done the test. So can move on from that on to the next. All right, so I fixed a few things that I wanted to sort out. Um, as I said, removed the fan fuses out of the fuse box and hijacked the positives to the relays with this nice big six mil twin core. So that's rated at 50 amps for that big long run all around around to here, uh, which I'm just I'm a lot more comfortable having those fans run off their own power wires like that. They run along here, twin core six mil to this new little fuse box here that I was talking about last time. Um, and that's the, the top one is the main power into the fuse box, which is now powering everything else. And uh, yeah, they each have their very own power to the battery. It's only a short run anyway, but um, you know, fuse pretty close to the battery for everything there. And uh, I just feel like that's gonna be a much more reliable setup than having everything through that one power. Uh, at the moment, Rex is just sorting out the O2 extension so we can get at that in there and we're almost ready to get it back onto the dyno to continue with our fault finding process um, of trying to figure out this goddamn issue. The final knob touch. Yeah. The final knobbing. Yeah, probably uh, the re-knobbing will probably touch the front. Is that screwing on or is it just... Yeah. Oh yeah, it was pretty sad when I took it off. Yeah. Oh. Ooh. Works though. Works. It's very close, but it works. That's the, the boot best. that I was talking about. So that's the boot we got made. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's a bit shit. I mean, we're not. It definitely could be better, but I mean, the the bloke who did it for us, he did it quite cheap, and he did it in a big hurry. So, um, you know, at that stage, we were hoping to have the car out of here by the end of the week. He was meant to do it, so he was um, he was sort of under the pump. <clears throat> But I mean, obviously, if you're willing to pay a trimmer enough and gave them enough time, they could make anything work. But yeah, um, work. it works in, though, in that, you know, it's much tidier than having, just having an exposed sort of thing. Yeah. I'm sure if we had, um, you know, more, more time and more money, we could probably get something better made. But as far as just, you know, the conversion goes, it, um, it does the job and looks quite nice. So that's what the driver's cockpit is looking like after our conversion, so... Shifter, pedal, honestly, just sitting on it on the dyno and stuff, it's it's quite ergonomic, it feels pretty good. And with all of those 340 ponies. So you can see over there, I've got my fuses in and everything, so I'm pretty happy with how that's turned out. Just been tidying up the wiring, working my way back to this corner. Rex woke up super sick this morning, so he's been having a hell of a fun day. Really fun day. Woke up and fires that I went to sleep. Okay, so. I don't know how to word that then. <laughs> so, interior is all sorted out. And we've got our OBD in here as well. Out of the way, easy to access. Beautiful, looking great. Pretty stoked with how this has all came out. I reckon it looks real good inside there, so. We also bled up the front brakes yesterday as well, which we had to do because of how we had to move the brake lines to fit the engine mounts. So, um, brakes are all bled now. So, you know, essentially, like I was saying yesterday, car's pretty much finished off. Just gotta get this, this fire sorted out so that we can go get the AC sorted out and then it's ready to go. All right, so we're back on the dyno. 
disconnected both knock sensors and we've got the O2s in and now and working and no different. So at least we've ruled it out though. So the knock sensors get plugged back in um, and it is nice to actually just finally have the factory O2s working. Um, but it wasn't the problem, unfortunately. So from here, we're working towards uh, <clears throat> this issue that um, I've actually been getting a lot of help from Jay Fagan at uh, Conversion Electrics by Jay Fagan there in Victoria. So a big thanks to Jay. We're now gonna start looking at coil wiring to see if this is our problem. Um, so this is at least somewhere to go from here, I suppose. Uh, so what we're gonna do, same thing we did the other day, we're gonna swap uh, the trigger pins for six and eight at the PCM for the coil side. And then I'm just gonna cross over the plug leads for six and eight and change them over. So now number six coil will actually be number eight and number eight will be number six. Uh, so then we will know if the issue then moves to cylinder eight we know that it could def definitely very well be an issue with the, uh, the wiring side on the trigger for the coil, or the coil somehow. Um, and if the, the issue then still stays on six, well then we know that that's obviously not the case. So, just an another test we can do to eliminate another possibility. Inconclusive. So yeah, repinned it. I started off by just swapping the leads and leaving the coils where they were, and the issue stayed on number six. Um, so that proved that it wasn't a problem with the trigger side, but there is a, a, a low side reference um, which goes to the PCM. So we figured uh, to prove that it wasn't an issue with the low side reference, I'd uncross the coil, the, the, the plug leads, uh, and then actually cross over the, the electrical coil plugs. Um, and guess what? The issue still stayed on number six. So it's uh, not a problem with that, with the coil side wiring. Right, so we're currently just making a flying lead. We've pulled the math sensor pin out of the PCM because we obviously do not need it anymore. And we're using that to make a flying lead um, for a new sensor wire with an ECU pin on it, for the PCM, which is going to be helpful in us doing a bit more fault finding. So uh, we've got some spare US car injector plugs. Uh, so we're gonna make our own injector plug, which is gonna have its own um, you know, shorting clip to its own independent 12 volt and that flying lead to the PCM. So that way we can start just pinning uh, injectors with a whole new set of wiring again, um, just in the hopes that we can find something. I mean, realistically our test um, the other day with swapping the injector pin outs to, you know, swapping that eight and six and the way that it didn't move and stayed on six, that should really have proved that it's not a wiring problem, but at least this, you know, will straight up rule out that possibility all out. Uh, not only that though, is obviously wherever we start having to go from, from here, um, we're still gonna be probably needing to use that flying lead a bit. So worth making one up, we'll keep it handy with us, but uh, yeah, I don't know. At this stage, we're pretty much just going back over a few things we've already tried by just doing it different ways and just continuing to try and, and rule stuff out um, because we're yeah, running out of I don't know how to things to check or test or, or where to go. Can't believe one car can be such an absolute pain. Well, actually, that's, that's a lie. I definitely can believe it. It just sucks. I wish it didn't. Oh, uh, we thought we'd chuck a leak down test on it. While we were going, just, just cause, why not rule something else out while we're at it? And uh, yeah, like hardly any. Um, actually incredibly good, considering it's not a fresh engine, so. Anyway, we were just swapping around coil pack rails so we could swap coil pack wiring and stuff just to try and find something. And uh, while we had all the coil packs and everything off anyway, we thought we'd just pull the rock cover off and have a look, see what we could see. Um, and while it was off, we thought we'd just do a leak down test while we can. So 15% compressor starting up, so that's what's changing now, but hardly anything, hardly any leak down. Well guys, I don't really know where we're gonna go from here. To be honest, at the moment we're just ruling things out for the sake of ruling things out, you know. Um, we're already pretty sure it's definitely not a mechanical fault and we've already done a compression test on that side, but we thought we'd do a leak down test anyway, just cause. I mean, at the moment we're just looking for something to tell us something because nothing is telling us anything. We've got no DTCs, like there's no errors, the ECU's not giving us any answers. None of our tests have been conclusive. We are not getting anything out of this thing. There is nothing that's working. And it's just... 
I have, I, I'm literally dumbfounded. I have no idea where to go from here. We've scoped the crank trigger. It's a little bit weird, but hey, I've never scoped a 58 tooth crank trigger before. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't like it was a dropping signal or anything. There wasn't massive flat lines or dips or anything like that. It was fairly consistent. While it was under, like, under load and breaking down, we scoped it. So it's been scoped. We've tried everything. We've tried every goddamn thing. I don't know what else to do. So we've just tried a new crank angle sensor once again, just for something, just to do something. And same result, no different. Inspected all the plug while I had the, you know, the starter out and everything, looking at the crank angle sensor. Um, but yeah, again, it's not something we thought would be the issue, but at this stage, we're just trying whatever. It's, it's got us just absolutely beat. You know, even at idle, um, the O2s are showing that it's just a little bit leaner on that bank. Um, you know, so the, the misfire, whatever's happening is there all the time. It's not just when it's going, when it's under load. It's just that when it's under load and it misses, you can really, you can feel it. Um, and that when it, that's when it becomes obvious. But obviously, whatever is happening is happening all the time. Um, and you know, it, it, it seems like it should be an injector issue, but it's not. That same injector plug has been on six different injectors now. Does the same thing. Seems like a wiring issue, but it's not because we've had that injector plug wired completely on its own um, from the trigger from the ECU all the way to the battery, giving it its own power, its own trigger um, with our fly lead. And guess what? It did the same freaking thing. Like, it just, it sh well, then you're like, well, then it should be the ECU, but it's not because we've tried a different ECU. We've tried a different OS. We've done that. Uh, I don't know. I know like the, the 24 tooth reluctor wheels, LS1 reluctor wheels on the crank, um, you know, they, they can get damaged fairly easy just by, you know, dropping a crank to it on a bench or something. You can easily bend or fold a tooth and it, and it can be pretty hard. But to the 58 tooths, um, you know, they're, they're pretty solid wheel, quite a solid unit. It's pretty hard to damage them. Um, there's nothing in the scope, like I said, that looks like it's one's super damaged, but we didn't hear the engine running before it was brought to us. You know, we didn't see it in the record. We didn't see it running. We don't know whether this was happening where beforehand when it was still in the other car. Um, and that would change things quite, quite dramatically because it would absolutely narrow down what could be an issue. Um, but you know, so the owner heard it running, but admittedly he wouldn't really know what he was looking for as far as an issue like this sort of thing. Like if we could have been there, had the scanner on the donor car, had it running, you know, did a log of it running and could see what was going on, um, we'd be so much better off at the moment trying to figure out what's going on with this thing. Anyway, unfortunately, it is just what it is. It's a product of what we do and, and what's what's gone on and the way things have happened. Um, it w You know, ideally, it would always be best off to have a donor um, to start the swap, you know, have the whole car. But at the end of the day, it's extra money. It's another car we've got to have room for. You know, as much as it's a good idea, it has its own issues, so... It just is what it is, but it's just, it's just incredibly frustrating, this issue, and nothing is conclusive, in case you haven't been able to tell by this video. And if you're sick of watching and you think it's terrible footage, trust me, it's terrible to live it at the moment. It's not a fun time, not good. Anyway, it's currently 4.30 p.m. on a Saturday, and I'm tired and hungry, and I'm going to go home. Like, we've just spent, you know, an hour even just going through logs on the scanner, trying to find any channel or any parameter that correlates with what's going on and there's nothing there's nothing else happening like you can see obviously for the o2 on that bank you can see the oscillations in the millivolts from it going a little bit lean on that lean condition from when it misses but apart from that there is nothing there's nothing else in the scanner no channels or anything that show anything that even correlates even a little bit you know, the advance stays the same. There's nothing the TPS is doing. There's nothing anything else is doing. All the pressure's solid. Everything's solid. Map's solid. Nothing else is doing it. <laughs> nothing else is... There's nothing... Nothing in the scanner. There's no DTCs. There's nothing. I'm... <sighs> just want to smash my head on the concrete. We can we can check the crank angle, the, the, the trigger wheel. Um, you know, it's a big job. We're going to have to pull the sump off and everything. It sucks, but at least... It puts that to rest as well. It's another thing eliminated, but it's another one of those things where, like, I, I don't know, honestly, if, if the trigger wheel's fine, then what? This feels like this thing's never gonna end. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is a beautiful Sunday and we're stuck here still trying to sort this issue. Not terrible Sunday. Terrible Sunday. Anyway, at the very least, we are 
finally making some headway. We are actually getting some answers and um, yeah, we're, we're, sort of, we're sort of coming to a T with, with where to go with it. So we come in this morning, I just wanted to double, triple check, confirm that we definitely can move it as we were doing the other day. So double check that we can move it and we can. It was, we, we can move the issue using the injector plugs. If I swap six and eight, the issue moves to eight. So it's definitely on the injector plug, the injector trigger, as we already thought. I just wanted to double, triple check, make sure we weren't just imagining things when we were moving at cylinders, just to confirm it wasn't anything mechanical. <clears throat> so based off the mechanical tests we've already done and the fact that it makes power and that you can move it physically onto another cylinder, we we're happy to completely rule out anything mechanical. So the next thing we actually did was um, we actually bridged injector triggers six and eight so that both injector six and eight were both being triggered by number eight trigger instead. So completely moved injector number six trigger from the equation altogether. And the issue went away. Um, no misfire, ran up, smooth as, everything's awesome. Sweet. Um, so what we did then was actually bridge six with injector trigger two, because it's, it's, it's the one before six in the firing order, so it made more sense for it to be triggered from two, because it'll fire closer to when it's meant to fire. Um, ran it back up, same thing, issue is gone. So by removing six injector trigger out of the equation, we removed the issue, which is what we actually had pretty much come to the conclusion was that it, the only thing that remained consistent through all of our fault finding was that it was on injector trigger six. No matter what wiring we used, no matter what we did, the issue always stayed on injector trigger six. So we've confirmed that, and we've already confirmed that it's not an ECU or OS issue because we've tried now three different PCMs and two different OSs. So um, we're at the point where the only thing I can think of that would cause an issue that would stay consistent to one cylinder or one injector trigger would be a trigger issue, a trigger wheel, a crank angle wheel issue. So, you know, these 58 tooth cranks are pretty hard to bend and damage, but who knows? For it to be this issue, it's gotta be something to do with a trigger. We're not convinced that it's wiring because we have no, there's no way that a wiring issue for the trigger would isolate the problem to one single cylinder. There's no way that that would happen. We've already changed the crank angle sensor yesterday. So it's gotta be something to do with the trigger. So where we're at at the moment is to now pull the sump and physically check the crank wheel uh, and see what the hell's going on because we obviously have an issue. So we definitely use the right cam gear. It's got the, the right, um, I mean, under, it's got the right trigger pattern on it for the Gen 4. Um, so I'm not convinced it's anything to do with the cam trigger. I'm just, I'm 100% sure it's gonna be something to do with this crank trigger. Uh, so anyway, we've gone through everything else. Now it's time to pull the sump, unfortunately, and uh, have a look, which I'm not looking forward to at all, but hey, gotta do what you gotta do. What do you reckon, Rex? Are you excited to pull this sump off? Mm. What? Come on. <laughs> Rex is really sick at the moment as well, which makes this whole process way better. Yeah. Sick as fuck. <laughs> sick to death. Alright. Get the sump off. Yeah, while you whinge about how much space we don't oh, have. Oh, hurry up and get it off. Fucking Why is it still on there? Because you keep whinging instead of helping. I'll punch your face off. <laughs> <laughs> Punch your lips off, cunt. Ah, <laughs> <coughs> uh, yeah. <coughs> Die quietly, would you? Stop making me laugh, then you fuck with. <laughs> gonna burn the shit out of my grabbers. Well, don't. Oh, oh no. Oh, it's like oh oh no, it's hot, it's hot, it's hot, 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 hot. Yeah, thanks for getting me a rag or something. Much appreciated. Oh, you've got a camera. Yeah, no, that's useless to me, isn't it? <laughs> how is it useless? Is the only reason everyone knows how good you are? Yeah, I'm going to clean up some oil with a fucking camera. Or use your fluffy microphone, you homo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll remember it when the YouTube's making more money than the workshop, and I'll be like, oi. That's not hard. <laughs> I'm, pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it already is. <laughs> what did you make, a hundred bucks last month? <laughs> that's more than the shop makes. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's not... <coughs> Let's not actually compare the two, it'll make me upset. It's hanging on at the front there, I'm gonna need you to... Yeah. Ooh, that's like... It's quite warm. Bit warm? Ah. Bit hot? Yeah, it's quite warm actually, love. Alright, inconclusive guys. As you can see, you can probably see up there. These 58 teeth trigger wheels, they're pretty, they're pretty thick. They're very different to the 24 tooth ones, they're pretty hard to damage. And um, from what we can see, there's nothing obvious. Um, that, that's showing any sort of damage 
Uh, you know, I've seen with some aftermarket cranks, the, the counterweights can get real close to the edge of the trigger wheel. And I've, I'd always worried about, uh, always wondered and been worried about uh, crank triggers actually picking up a signal from the counterweight. But this is a totally stock bottom end. We didn't pull the bottom end apart at all. So it's factory crank, factory trigger wheel. Like that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and we can't see anything obvious as far as damage or anything that will be causing this issue. So inconclusive. So, you know, we now know what the issue is. We've narrowed it down to exactly what the problem is, which is the injector driver for number six. But we still have no idea what's actually causing the issue. Um, and we're pretty much out of ideas at this point. So anyway, sump's gonna go back on, button that all back up and um, see what we can come up with as far as where to go next, what to do. Might have to um, do a bit more work with the scope try and do a bit more scoping and figure out what's going on. Again, I, I really find it, I, I, I'm finding it really hard to accept that it's a wiring issue or noise. I can't imagine why noise or anything would, would isolate it to a single uh, cylinder. You know, why, why would a wiring issue or noise isolate it to one cylinder? Doesn't make sense. But then neither does this misfire altogether. So. All right, back together. Uh... I can't believe how difficult this thing's been. All right, so we've got the patrol on the hoist. We're just gonna make up a few heat shields for a bit of wiring and stuff that we noticed um, that, you know, runs pretty close to pipes that's been getting fairly hot and, and cause going to, you know, is going to cause a problem eventually. So a few heat shields for a few things of, um, you know, just stuff we've noticed from all this dynoing we've been doing, trying to find this issue. <clears throat> Another thing I would like to point out as well, um, this thermo fan setup and this radiator, just work amazingly. Like this thing will run at, you know, 102 degrees and the hot tank on the on the passenger side, you can't even touch it. And you know, the cold side tank, you can just, it's cold. Like, and you can feel the heat coming out of the thermo fan on the passenger side, it's, you know, hot. And then the air coming out of the thermo fan on the driver's side, is just like cool. Like it's incredible how well um, this massive radiator in these fans are working. Uh, as we talked about, we are going to go ahead and put a colder thermostat in it because, you know, this radiator is working perfectly. It's working awesome, but the thing still runs fairly warm just because it's got such a hot thermostat. So for anyone who doesn't already know, uh, the LS is designed to run real hot from factory, uh, mostly due to emissions. So uh, it, it's all to do with the emissions equipment of the engine. Uh, it's not really for anything else apart from emissions. So uh, there's nothing wrong with getting them a little bit cooler. Not super cool, but you know, if it'll run at around sort of that 80, high 80s to 90 degrees, um, that'd be awesome. But there's no need for it to run over 100 degrees. So anyway, guys, super frustrating at how well everything is working with this, this rig, um, how, how good it's making power. Everything is freaking ace. Um, obviously we still have to give that box a really good test on a road drive, but apart from that, everything's awesome except for this freaking issue, which we still can't pinpoint exactly what the cause is. So at the very least now we know that we have a way that we can get around it if we need to. Uh, we can bridge this injector driver with another driver, run two injectors off the same driver and it will fix the issue. But um, we'd rather obviously try and find out what the actual source of the problem is. So anyway, um, that's going to be it for this episode. Again, sorry for it's not being super action packed or anything, but um, you know, I thought I'd take you through our fault finding process a little bit, and you can see how how our brains tick and, and what we try and do to to get to the to the issue and and to pinpoint it down to one place. Uh, if it was bad to watch, trust me, it was bad to be here and doing it as well. So very frustrating. <clears throat> we'll keep moving forward. I'll keep talking to some other people that may have some other ideas. At least we've crossed off a lot of things in this episode of, of what the potential issue could be. Um, and you know, we've checked that crank wheel, we've checked a lot of things. So we are getting closer by process of elimination, but it's just, it's super frustrating not knowing exactly what this, this cause is. So anyway, thanks for watching. As always, tune in for the next one. Hopefully we have some more answers and hopefully we get this thing finally sorted and we can see what sort of power it will finally make because I'm pretty excited. So let me know in the comments what you think about this episode filmed on this camera. If you'd like me to film a bit more on this camera instead of the GoPro, I will. Uh, start moving that way. Um, I'm happy to change things up, whatever people sort of really, really like. So let me know. Anyway, thanks for watching. As always, smash the like, smash the subscribe. Peace out. See you, bye.